he's, he's the real host. Okay, good enough. The mic's working, can you hear me? Yes? Good. Well, I'll, I'll start and we'll see if anything else needs to happen. Good evening, thank you for coming to this event at the Frontline Club. I guess some of you will have uh, been here earlier and seen the photographs, we're surrounded by them. They are obviously um, terrible and self-explanatory, but they are, they are the reason for this, I think, slightly unusual event. Um, I've been, I guess many of you will have been to many meetings here about Syria in the last uh, four and a half years. This one is distinguished by the, the grimness of the images that we see, but they do, of course, tell an important story, and we want to hear a bit about that. And I think perhaps if you agree, you, the audience, you decide, but I think that we'll talk about the images, the story of how uh, they came into the public domain, which is in itself a fascinating story, but also perhaps broaden out the discussion both on the platform and with you in the audience to talk more widely about the Syrian crisis. Um, I'm sure everybody's aware of the recent developments, just the last few days alone, of the Russian intervention directly on the side of the, the Syrian government. We're all very aware of the heightened uh, interest in the issue of Syria because of the huge numbers of Syrians who are fleeing to Europe. It's hard to escape the Syrian story, though of course now that it's been going on for such a long time, I think everybody who follows it knows that there is a degree of fatigue with a story that seems both complicated, repetitive, and very, very bleak. And there's little more bleak that certainly that I've seen uh, following this than the, the images that uh, Caesar produced. Um, I'm Ian Black, I'm the Middle East editor of The Guardian. On the platform, we have with us a very distinguished and very useful panel. On my left, we have Moaz Mustafa, who was born and raised in Damascus before moving to the US at the age of 12. He's the current executive director for the Syrian Emergency Task Force, which is a non-profit organization based in Washington, <coughs> DC. It, it advocates a political solution to the Syrian conflict and works to alleviate the humanitarian suffering of Syrian refugees. He's worked uh, as a staffer for US Congressman Vic Snyder and another one worked briefly with the Egyptian opposition. Mustafa is also a member of the Syrian Association for the Missing and I think Prisoners of Conscience, it should say. And he is actually representing the Caesar team at the exhibition and this evening's discussion. On my right immediately we have Osama Felix Dara. Dara? Dara. Dara. He's a German Syrian activist who's based in Berlin. He's an expert on politics, Islamic studies. He worked as a lecturer in Middle Eastern politics at the Arab University in Damascus. And in Berlin, he's a board member of the Association of the German Syrian um, Humanitarian Organizations. And he collaborates with the representative of the Syrian National Coalition to Germany. My far right is my good friend and colleague Martin Chulov from The Guardian, who has covered the Syrian crisis valiantly for us from the beginning. On the far left, we have um, Christian Benedict, who's the campaign manager for Amnesty International in the UK, and he manages Amnesty's uh, activities and campaigns um, on, the, um, on the Syrian crisis. So that's the panel. Um, I'm going to ask everybody just to say a few words at the beginning to introduce themselves a little bit beyond what I've just said to pick out a theme or two, um, then we will, after that, open up the discussion to the floor. I want everybody to ask lots of questions. Please don't make statements. We all want to learn from each other and to try to get somewhere. So I'll ask Moaz, please, to kick off with a few words. Thank you. Sure. Um, and thank you to the Frontline Club for, for hosting us here, and thank you for all for, for coming. Uh, to this and, and for all the people that, that really worked on, on organizing this. 
It's a very important exhibit. As um, was mentioned, I, I, I'm a Syrian American. I, I moved to the United States uh, as a young teenager, and uh, I've been there um, since then. And I, I work, um, you know, as a director of this NGO. Um, but I'm here in my capacity as, as part of. Of, of the team that, that is sort of the custodian of the Caesar file uh, in general. And, you know, with Syria, th there's so much to talk about, whether it's the constant barrel bombs, the chemical weapons attacks that happened, and, and the ones that continue to happen, the use of chlorine, um, and, you know, and the list goes on, ISIS, et cetera. And yes, it is a very compli complicated situation from the outside looking in, but, you know, I'm constantly in between sort of the border, Syria, Turkey, and, uh, and, and the U.S. and Europe. And when I'm there and I talk to internally displaced refugees or talk to the sort of brother or daughter or father of, of people that were killed um, and so on, it's, it's very simple for them. So when you ask them, why are you in the situation that you're in, they'll mention that for nine months we protested peacefully by the admission of the dictator himself in one of his speeches saying that there were no sort of violence, there was no armed, uh, you know, actors uh, for many months at the beginning of that revolution, which uh, at some point took a turn when, when people from the army itself decided to stop shooting at their own people and to protect the protesters uh, going forward. And as we saw sort of lack of action by the United Nations due to the Russian veto and and lack of leadership um, by, by, by freedom-loving nations and, and those who we call the allies of, of the Syrian people, whether if it's the friends of the Syria people, et cetera. Um, and we saw a lot of action, in, in, uh, as well as statements, not just statements as, as we get, but a lot of action from the allies, the admirable allies of the Assad regime, Iran, where you've got constant flights from Tehran, where you have Hezbollah, you have uh, militias that are being shipped in to kill Syrians, and as we see now, uh, the latest with uh, with uh, the the Russian intervention, which has barely, if at all, targeted ISIS, but really pushed to to fight against the moderate opposition and has killed many children already and civilians. Um, I, you know, there's a lot to say, but I, I would start by by just talking a little bit about the, the person who made a lot of this possible, uh, working with, with the Caesar team, which is Caesar himself, a man who's apolitical. He wasn't in the protests at the beginning. He, he's really sort of a simple man. He comes from the rural areas of, areas of Syria. He's a forensic photographer for the military police, um, whose routine before the revolution was to take pictures of any incidents that happened under the auspices of the Ministry of Defense. If there was a car wreck, a fire, a drowning, he would go, he would take pictures for documentation, etc. And one day in 2011, he was asked to go to the one of the military hospitals in Damascus and take pictures of uh, death incidents, ones that were told, you know, uh, and, and, and the pathologists that were ordered to say died of natural causes. Uh, all of a sudden they stopped breathing or there was a heart attack and so on. And realized that the people, he was taking pictures of that first day were 15 men, women and children, civilians that were tortured to death. And early on he contacted a relative right after that episode and said, do you know anyone that can help get people out of here? And they contacted uh, people in the opposition that have been able to help families escape that were being targeted by the regime. And uh, of course, you know, the offer for help was there and, and the question of whether you'd be interested in doing this a little bit longer and collecting this evidence and it was his decision to stay. And for him, uh, again, someone who's looking at this from a much more simplistic point of view, he wasn't looking at accountability and justice <laughs> and what prosecutions could take place. He wanted <coughs> families to have closure, to know what happened to their loved ones. He himself has seen some of his own neighbors, etc. He was taking pictures of them after being tortured to death in their own families back uh, in his village, etc. Didn't know what had happened to them and he couldn't say anything about it. And, and that was really sort of his main drive to do what he did. And for two and a half years, he snuck out flash drives. He was a military policeman, so as he went through rebel-held territories or the regime, he had a, a, mil a military and a civilian ID. He was in danger, really, for his life from everyone. But he did this. He did this in the hopes that people would Again, families would find closure, and 
um, later on after he came out uh, and, and agreed to come to the United States to speak at an open hearing at the House Foreign Affairs Committee to go to the Holocaust Museum to, to, you know, to show the world what happened and, and go further than the, the massive sacrifice and work that he had already da done, uh, you know, is the best way to describe him other than being, you know, fearful for his life, et cetera, is to see that people, some that saw the photos, like many of us, were outraged, but that zero to no, you know, no action was, was really done. So a lot of outrage, um, uh, but, but not, not much action. And, um, and this continues today. I mean, the best way I can describe this is it really a never again moment that, that continues to this day. There are still 300,000 people about in Assad jails. Um, many Syrians would tell you that their own families are missing or know that they are in Air Force Intelligence or Palestine branch or one of these different uh, intelligence branches run by the Assad regime. And you see their children, their women, their elderly people that had nothing to do with anything uh, that were stopped and had to face this fate. And even though justice is important, accountability is important, but we can't bring the, these people back. We can't bring back their lives. They're gone. But we can maybe try to prevent the other 300,000 people from suffering the same fate. You know, we talk about the refugee crisis, and a lot of people are paying attention to, to Syria now because refugees are coming to Europe. And it's sad, you know, we, we pay more attention to it because they're coming to Europe and now that's the <coughs> national security issues and economic issues, et cetera. Um, the Syrian people really do feel deserted by the international community. Even when people care about them, they care about them because it's, you know, based on their own sort of interests. Um, and, you know, and, and the story sort of goes on, the barrel bombs go on, the, the refugees and the population displacement go on. And even though ISIS, the other sort of uh, oppressor of the Syrian people that has come in, uh, one that, by the way, if you YouTube how many people are fighting ISIS, you'll see that the, the, the Syrian opposition and the Maori rebels have fought ISIS since day one before <laughs> fighting ISIS was cool back in 2013 and so on. And you know there, and we see the regime barrel bombing these people. We see we see Russia itself doing so. Uh, and so, although there are no friends, ISIS and the regime, they do have a mutual interest. And that mutual interest is to counteract uh, what's really the biggest threat to them, which is the Syrian people. So, thank you, Moaz. Can I ask you, Christian, to to talk about as we're here, we've heard about Caesar yeah. and we've seen the images. Tell us, if you would, a little bit about what it's like to work on a human rights issue in the context of the Syrian crisis. Tell us a little bit about public opinion, and, and uh, it's interesting. <coughs> I actually, uh, before I come to that, I just sure. wanted to, there was a point I thought you were going to, and you didn't, <coughs> which is around the justice and the accountability issue, which Ian wants me to talk about, which is what mechanisms do you want to come out of this? You're involved with the French uh, investigations, and the that's actually a really good opening, I think, and that might actually give a little bit of optimism to the debate. You mean the recent the investigation of the French and yeah. Do War people know about that? Can you explain a bit? I don't think a lot of people do know about it, but I think your guy sure. is very much behind well, it. Well, I could say that, you know, we the Caesar photos, when they first uh, were all sort of compiled mm -hmm. and out, uh, were given to a third party country in Europe, neutral to the conflict. Yeah. Uh, and they were given the permissions that they can give these photographs to national courts, regional courts, international tribunal, or future Syrian court post Assad. And we've pursued since then the identification of individuals, contacting their families, and finding out um, who are willing to bear witness mm -hmm. about what happened, et cetera. And so Ambassador Stephen Rapp, who was here earlier, um, it has played a really a major role in, in going out there and talking to prosecutors. I can tell you Germany, uh, as well as the French, uh, there's an effort in Sweden, uh, in Turkey as well. Um, Many of these countries were looking at them for universal jurisdiction. They're willing to let us mm -hmm. sort of present cases, especially if there are refugees there now uh, that have family members that have identified. But we're also working on identifying dual nationalities, so people mm -hmm. that have a European nationality or a U.S. nationality that we can then start national courts. And, and we've started to see at Amnesty uh, footage coming to us, photos of uh, alleged refugees who are here in Germany, for instance, or in other European countries who are alleged to be members of uh, militias, including actually um, people who are party to what happened uh, in, these, in, in these torture dungeons. That's right. So that's going to be an interesting 
dimension for Amnesty and other human rights organizations and other international justice mechanisms to be looking at as well. Where, because, I mean, you, you touched on it a little bit there. You know, the international community has failed. You know, there is no ICC investigation. That's obviously largely because Russia and China uh, blocks that. But it is important to keep the focus on the impunity that is driving <coughs> this conflict. The fact that it's people committing war crimes in a culture of impunity, people facilitating those war crimes, uh, lots of people justifying the war crimes, actually, and, and, and a large amount of people turning a blind eye to the war crimes. That's probably one of the more difficult things when you work in an organization like Amnesty. Mm. How many people are actually quite okay with this? They're quite blasé. They say, no, 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 you know, this is too difficult. Real politic. We need to talk with uh, the regime. We need to bring them in. We need to put that aside because there's, there's bigger issues uh, in play now, which is actually a quite disgraceful position to be taken. Those uh, officials, no matter how how high up they are in the command structure, uh, if they have been party to committing or commissioning grave violations, as we can, can see in these horrific photos, they need to be held to account. How they're held to account, there's many ways of doing that. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll flesh that out on the panel uh, itself. Obviously, Amnesty would like to see some form of international justice mechanism triggered. Uh, but as I said, at the moment, Russia and China are blocking that, and it seems quite I wouldn't say unrealistic, but difficult at the moment to see something like an ICC investigation triggered. That doesn't mean to say the accountability track is, 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 is dead. There are still investigations going on. There, are, there is evidence gathering going on inside Syria. And that, you know, with, with the aim of one day holding to account people who have uh, committed or commissioned grave violations, as, as we as see in these uh, seas of photos. Um, and those need supporting, whether it's the UN's International Commission, uh, the, the COI, Commission of Inquiry, or uh, the Commission for International Justice and Accountability. These are really important. They need more support to enable them to do their work. But right now, it, it is difficult. It, is, it can be quite demoralizing. You know, Syria is fragmenting within this culture of impunity. And you, know, you couple that culture of impunity with a culture of fear, and you have this really toxic mix of a kill or be killed attitude, which is driving Syria <coughs> further into the abyss. So belligerents and their commanders and politicians around them need to be put on notice that one day there will be some form of justice, some form of international justice mechanism, if only to act as a deterrent against what we see uh, in, the, in these horrific photos. We're a long way from that, but that's where I would say the focus needs to be. Inevitably, I think in the discussion, we're going to go on to the wider okay. Why Thanks, so. Martin. You, you, when when the Caesar story came out, I, I'm just going to blow not my own personal trumpet for a minute. I'm going to blow the Guardian's trumpet. We we published the Caesar pictures with CNN when they, the report came out in January 2014. And I'm not blowing it just for the sake of blowing it, because to show I hope that there's an important interaction between people who are pursuing uh, uh, justice in the very difficult setting of Syria and the international media. I think Martin would agree, let's talk about that in a minute, about it's very difficult as journalists covering Syria. It throws up endless challenges, difficulties, dangers, and, and problems. So Martin, January 2013, at that point, we were already, what, two and a half years into the war. Well, I just wonder what your reaction was when, it, you know, in the context of the things that you'd seen and experienced and reported on until that point. I thought that the publication of these images was actually a, a defining moment in the sense that uh, here was, here was a, a time where there was undeniable evidence, uh, clearly verifiable proof of industrial scale killing going on uh, on, on behalf of one side. It, it was a very important uh, event in the sense that before that there had been so much narrative and narrative unfortunately had been prevailing over objective truths. But here was an objective truth. Here was something which was undeniable uh, to those who carried it out or certainly to those who'd, who'd endured it. Uh, that was the first time I'd seen anything like that and there hasn't been terribly much since. Um, it certainly wasn't eight months later uh, in the chemical weapons attack in Gulta. But this was a line in the sand. This was a, a, a mark uh, where 
people could, those who had suffered, uh, the, the families who had lost uh, tens of thousands of people to, to the Syrian regime's dungeons, that there could be some form of accountability in the future. And I'm glad this conversation has kicked off on the theme of accountability because I've covered a lot of conflict in the Middle East in the last 10 years, and I've never seen anything like this with such unchecked brutality, uh, with, uh, with, with protection being given to uh, the perpetrators on, on both sides. But let's just speak for the Assad regime for, for the moment. Uh, at, at a diplomatic level, uh, at, at, a, at a moral level, at a military level. There has to come a point where accountability replaces impunity because impunity is a key driver of, of uh, the forces that are tearing apart Syria and by extension the Middle East at the moment. Osama, when you look at the situation in Syria today, we were just talking about Damascus, your hometown where, where I've just been but you can't go. Um, when you look at the situation, do you have any grounds for optimism at all, whether on the specific important issue of accountability for terrible crimes or more broadly? There, were people, there are people who would argue that the events of the last few days, few months as well, have cumulatively made an end to the Syrian war even harder to envisage, certainly on terms which I think most people would recognize as just. What's your general sense of the way things are going? Well, it doesn't look good by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, thank you all for coming out. Uh, it's really important for you to show as citizens something for Syria. Um, yes, yeah, certainly the last couple of days have seen a Russian air campaign that has duped the United Nations and that has duped especially the White House in thinking West, we can acquiesce to their participation in bombing <laughs> ISIS. But I spoke to FSA commanders in Idlib last night 90% of the targets that are being hit are, of course, in Idlib, the surrounded parts of Homs. These are opposition strategic depth areas. They've bombed schools. They've bombed Roman archaeological sites. Uh, this is a scorched earth policy. They used, used four types of cluster bombs, which is what I hear. I haven't seen any pictures yet. Um, but yeah, there's, no, there's not a lot of ground for optimism, except to, to say that the justice of our cause will prevail. As Syrians, I, I, I really ha have to say this is an extremely resilient people, and they've already showed this. I mean, to live under siege. I mean, I, I, I grew up in Germany for for a good part of my life, and I went through the through this uh, system of never again and the Holocaust and so forth. I mean, if you look at the 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 siege of Warsaw, the ghetto there, they only held out against the Nazis for for 21 days. How is it possible for the Ruta? the eastern lung of Damascus to be under complete siege for the better part of two and a half years. I mean complete siege. Well, the, the truth is that um, the Arabic houses have very deep wells. They have an independent water source. They are very into home gardening right now. And uh, I represent on this panel today the Association of German Syrian Humanitarian Groups. There's about 90 uh, associations in Germany that work exclusively for Syrian. They're all Syrian carried. And we are about 40 of them. We've uh, united. And what we do is we, is we teach them through, through Skype how to burn plastic bags and how to make gasoline from it, how to put the kid on the bike, and to make some electricity for yourself so you can charge your iPhone and, computer and, and communicate with us. Uh, this is an extremely stressful uh, job and nobody prepared us for this. Just by way of introduction, really briefly, um, I was one of those expatriate Syrians that used to go back and see all the good parts of Syria. Look at this beautiful culture and, and, and mosaic. You know, you can drink with Christians and Druze and Muslims. <laughs> it's wonderful. Without seeing any of the disadvantages, you, know, you, 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 you pay a little, a little bit of money, you can go to the, to the Golanites. You need a new passport, no problem, just, just pay 50 pound and so forth. But um, when I went there in 2005 to spend a couple of years there uh, to research a PhD, I taught at one of the first private universities there that had come out. And it was really a little California in the desert, uh, you know, with, with big walls and generators and nice grass. And I taught the first human rights course officially in Syria. Um, and of course, uh, it was really interesting. I mean, the, the the university thought it would get Western attention, and I would think that I'd do something nobody's done before. And 
the regime would say it, it has human rights, tried to come in uh, with, with its camera to, to show, look, we even have an idiot from, from Germany who's, who's teaching it, right? Um, but it certainly was an experience, especially after I came back, to find out that you know, more than half of my students had become activists. And this is basically the new dynamic in the Middle East in the last 10 years, people saying that this is a static society. No, it isn't. It wasn't. The Arab Spring did not come out of nowhere. It's, it's basically a paradigm shift in technology and the new paradigm of a young Syrian, or Arab for that matter, looking to act locally and thinking globally. And this is the activist. Well, this is, uh, this is a, a new model. And I also wanted to say exactly what we're looking at so that we understand each other. This is an extract of 55,000 pictures. There were 35 pictures in the room th this afternoon. Now there's only five or six. When you see them all in a circle, you really feel it, uh, like, a, like in a cemetery. Uh, these pictures were five photos to a person. There is a totalitarian systematic policy of photographing each uh, ex-prisoner, I guess, five times. That was the job of Caesar. Um, what happened was in Syria, you had the regime deal with peaceful uprisings. It had no political answer to this except to push them towards violence and to make it a dichotomy. And th this hasn't changed. Putin is trying the same thing now, basically pursuing Assad's policy that we will have ISIS or Assad to choose from. This is a very, very dangerous thing, not only for us as Syrians, but for your security also. And what the regime did at the time is set up a central crisis management cell that set up in itself basically committees all over the country to arrest anybody who could be suspected of being an oppositional person. I mean, for discussing, I think The Guardian wrote, uh, arrested for discussing the events in a negative way would be enough to get you into the system. And as a Syrian, you know, whoever goes into these into the hands of the Mukhabarat will not easily come out. Um, so there's a, there was a pipeline there. Uh, the dangerous prisoners who had uh, a military background, who were affiliated with the FSA, who were doctors or so forth, they were immediately killed. And I think there's a difference here to what the, diff to what the regime had been doing before. Torturing to extract information is different than torturing to kill as many as you can possibly get your hands on. And this is what, what we see here. Did that start straight away? That did when start straight away. The, the CCMC was set up in August. This was Ramadan 2011, but Ramadan. Uh, it was set up there, and that's so when five we had mo five months, so five so months the beginning. into it. Yeah. And there were arrests b before. But what we see is, is an, in, an industrial pipeline of peop people being arrested anywhere in the country, being processed, tortured right there. OK, he's important send him to Damascus. And like I said, there's, you know, my own family went through this pipeline, part of them, having nothing to do with anything. Uh, they just en ended up there. Um, and it's important to note that this, is a, this has a bureaucracy behind it. Each of the carcasses has three numbers. The number of the prisoner himself, the number of the handling Mukhabarat units, and the number of the coroner or of the medical person who forged his death certificate, saying that he did not die of gouged out eyes. He, he died of a heart attack. This is what, what we see 10,000 fold. So this is the reality of what happens in Syria. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to discussing this with you, but also to hear what, what we can do about it. Can I ask that? I want to, you make that very important point about the, the way in which most recently, Putin is encouraging this narrative about Syria. The choice is simple between ISIS, Daesh, people who behead others and behave with terrible barbarity, and Assad <coughs> on the other. Now, Assad, OK, you know, not great, but better than the alternative. And that narrative, the choice, it's not only, of course, from Vladimir Putin that you hear. You hear it a lot in this country. You hear it a lot from people who are respected commentators mm -hmm. in the media. You hear it a lot in the discourse about what this country, whether this country really matters or not, leave, it, leave aside. But whether this country should, should it deal with the really bad guys or the less bad guys? And it's an important part of the discussion. Well, how, do we, how do we deal with, with that? 
it's important to amplify and support and fund in, in some senses those, uh, they're going to be opposition elements primarily, uh, who have a vision for Syria which is, from our perspective, based on human rights, based on our understanding of what security and stability uh, is about. That certainly, you know, in, in 2011 when, when we started really ramping up this work, we talked about having solidarity with people peacefully demanding their human rights and other's sure. human rights and defiance against those trying to stop them. Obviously, you know, when things get militarized, um, and, and, and when the regime is deliberately targeting protest leaders, human rights activists, there's, there's a number of them still still disappeared. Um, and these are the brightest and the best, and that's a deliberate strategy. Coupled, we should say, as, as our Syrian colleagues would be able to attest, releasing a number of people from, from prisons in, in mid-2011 who would change the color of the uprising, certain jihadist uh, individuals who were, who were detained uh, previously. It's, it's a blunt strategy, but it's also a smart strategy to, to deliberately change the color of the uprising. But it is important to be mapping out and engaging who are the Syrians who do want to bring about an effective transition based on rights, based on justice, but based on human rights and based on justice, which is about fair trial standards. We know not all Syrians in the opposition are like that, and we've got to be honest and clear about that. But well. Mars, can we, do we, are we, can we be confident that the, the, the mainstream, I use a slightly artificial word, but the mainstream Syrian opposition is committed to rights and to justice, and that there is a middle ground that gives the lie to the false dichotomy between Assad and Daesh? Absolutely. First of all, you know, we're, we're saying we, we have this choice between two evils. The fact is that there are three parties to this conflict. There's ISIS, there's Assad, and there's uh, the Syrian opposition, which I call, honestly, the Syrian people. I, some of my work with the Syrian Emergency Task Force, for example, is to go inside and to work with help nurture these civil governing structures that are rising mm -hmm. up across these liberated and contested areas. Um, and you see from the ground up, at least they, you know, so, you know some of these councils are trying sort of at least pseudo-democratic elections. Uh, I remember one time I went inside uh, a village called uh, Kherbet de Jos. A day after it was liberated, um, it was torched. It was burned by, by the regime as they were retreating. And the first shocking thing was that people from Kilis camp in, in Turkey wanted to go in right away. So I'm going back into this village with these <coughs> villagers themselves. Their houses were all burned down, and they had captured about 300 Assad regime soldiers. I was so angry at what I saw in this village, as it's seeing every home torched and looted. Just, you know, why would you do this? You're retreating. At least leave it as is. So, so angry myself that I, I was just imagining what they would do to these 300 prisoners. Uh, they must, they're going to eat them alive. And then I went and I saw that they're sharing their flour and, and their food uh, with these prisoners. They were keen on making sure that they uh, feed them and keep them uh, safe until they can be taken to a civilian court. Uh, uh, that, that would be, that, that was, there was one set up in, in a village a few kilometers away. Um, and, and I remember to this day, 75% of those three, 75 of these 300 actually joined the, the, the local mil militias in that area, the co local opposition, um, just out of the treatment that they saw. And what was heartbreaking too, by the way, when I was there, I went and visited the prisoners. And so I was asking them, you know, what happened? Someone hurt you, where are you from, et cetera. And one, one, one I was there with my colleague, this young lady um, from Homs, and she was angry too. And she said, who's from Homs? And some stood up, and who's from Baba Amr, the specific neighborhood which was flattened sure. and somebody ra raised his hand so he came up and she asked him how could you be part of this regime your family must be dead your whole neighborhood is no longer exists and 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 there I, it was really heartbreaking because the, the young man said well I had no idea we, 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 we don't even have access to our phones we're here we're, we're gone for a long period of time so you know, you see sort of even those regime soldiers that, that are being sort of drafted that are, regardless of what their background is, um, that, that are forced to fight for, for the throne of, of this dictator. Another thing I want to add in terms of is there, for example, a, you know, a moderate option. You have 3,715 or so defected officers from the Assad regime. Mm. These are officers that served in uh, a, a secular regime army 
for a very long time that were left out to dry. Nobody supported them. Some of them are uh, in these camps right outside the borders. Others are inside still fighting. Um, but if that's not a secular guarantee of even an armed element of the opposition, I don't know what is. I mean, that's what, the, what these guys represent. And as um, Christian said, you know, they, they don't release someone like General Harmoush, but they do release somebody like Abu Khalid Suri, who was part of Al-Qaeda, sure. which was really sort of a planned thing. And to this day, ISIS um, is made up, less than 10% of ISIS is actually Syrian. I mean, <laughs> these guys are not Syrian. They're Iraqis and other foreign fighters, et cetera, that are there. What about Jabhat al-Nusra? Do Jab we hear a lot about Sure, Jabhat al-Nusra, uh, you know, at its leadership, and it is, is, is something that, that is completely does not go along with the values of who Syrians are and, yeah. and what they want and why they came out for uh, in the first place. But look, a lot of the people that, if, if you go to, to a local sort of area and you have somebody that wants to defend, he has no choice but to defend his, his area, and you have to choose between um, maybe a Western-backed opposition that barely by the dropper gets sort of support or someone that may pay them more or have something to defend with and they may choose to go with that. I don't consider some of those local foot soldiers that are there as someone who wants to have a khilafa or wants to uh, uh, and, and, and so on. Yeah. You want to Can I add here? I think it's very important to understand what has happened in Syria. If I may just recap the chronology of escalation. You had the first six months where you have the biggest mass demonstrations anywhere in the Arab world. I mean, to literally come out and demonstrate in Syria under the threat of death takes an immense courage that you have. And you had that proportionately in the cities and in the countryside. This is an, this is an important element for Syria. Peacefully, obviously, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, we have the videos. If you look at the videos from Idlib or from, from, from Homs, I can see that there's literally more than 100,000 people from Idlib, which is a small town. It's everybody who lives there that, that came out. The counterinsurgency strategy of the regime was basically partly what we saw in Algeria in the 90s when the Islamists won the election, and that is to open the jails. They set out in Saidnaya prison. They had an incubator for Sunni jihadists that they were instrumentalizing against the Americans in Iraq. And the Syrian re regime has a long history of manipulating jihadist groups all around. You see, you have Israel and you have Lebanon uh, and Syria. Those are the two players, and the playing field was Lebanon, obviously. So you, so you move around these small pieces, and you can no never say uh, who is responsible for it if they do something. Now, in Syria, they opened the jails, and they did not only let out, say, about 600 Al-Qaeda operatives. <clears throat> they also let out general uh, criminals and they hired them for shabiha. This means thugs. Sort of, it means ghosts in, in, in Arabic, but it's, it's basically thugs. And these were the guys set upon the demonstrations. The demonstrators are, are, are there. They rush in with knives and stab them and batons. Meanwhile, you have anonymous shooters up on, on, on the roof. Now, in turn, you have a reaction from the crowd always, having people protect their neighborhoods from looting and their families especially women. If you have women demonstrators there and you have thugs come, come in, it's something of a, it's an electric issue for, for Syrians. Um, now here, the regime could set up a narrative that of, of course we are fighting an armed insurgency funded by the outside and they set up this big ghost called Bandar, uh, he's, he, was the he was the Saudi ambassador in Washington, put him out as the person behind this whole affair and of course the long-term strategic narrative is that if we kill the moderates enough, the only ones that will be left are, of course, ISIS and us. And what he's counting on, is essentially, is that one day the West will come, especially the states, um, the states, not the civil society actors like us, um, will, will come and say, okay, pragmatism will suggest here. Oh. We cannot fight this war on behalf of the Syrian people against an army funded by Russia and, and Iran, and also from Iraq, and that has militias from all over. It's, it's chaos. Look, we have to find somebody who we can deal with. We'll, we'll take the one without, without the beard. Right? Okay. Now, for Syrians, it's the other way around, and it's very important to see this here. The lesser evil for Syrians 
are anyone who can come in and provide security. Because what you have between Baghdad and the Mediterranean is a scenario of absolute insecurity for the Sunni majority population. I mean, look, Syrian Islam, the way I know it, is of course, you know, don't, don't cheat in business and respect your neighbor. That's, it's, it's very Sufistic. And the biggest testament to that is that you have all these minorities emerge historically. They wouldn't be there if you had a radical Islam there. So when we look at ISIS, for example, ISIS is, a, is an Iraqi uh, affair. The leadership are ex-Saddam Hussein Ba'athist officers. Um, in Iraq, they were demonstrating against the <coughs> Shiite government of al-Maliki. The US and England withdrew from Iraq, leaving them there, ignored their mass demonstrations all across the Euphrates, gave hellfire rockets to the Maliki government, and then you have nothing than ISIS. Now, in Syria, ISIS is also there, and it's a strategic re retreat for them. They can gain resources. They have a border to Turkey there. But they are foreign to us. Let me, let me stop you there, if they, I may. Let no. Me. They also, they also attacked. <laughs> they, Syrians are stubborn, as you can They say. attacked the revolution. They killed Syrians. That's they right. killed a lot of the tribesmen there. This is not an issue that will be so easily forgotten. Their image is tarnished in Syria, and they have no social roots. We'll come back to that. I just wanted to hear from Martin on this issue, and then speak to have a word from Hanan here, please. Well, the the arc of evolution has been very uh, our revolution has been very important, and. I've had 13, up, up to 15 trips into opposition-held Syria since, uh, since January 2012, and I've seen firsthand, along with many other colleagues, uh, the effect that this increasing Islamization of, of parts of the Syria, Syrian opposition has had, and ac how it ha has actually been hatched. As, as my friend said, uh, the Assad regime has had a long history of uh, using uh, Salafi jihadists to their own ends. Uh, how did most of the, the foreign fighters who, uh, who fought the Americans and, and then uh, took on the Iraqis in the, the, sorry, the, the Shia majority government of Iraq, how did they get there? They got in there via Damascus airport and they were taken to the border and set free. Uh, cast forward though to 2011, uh, a series of very important uh, so-called amnesties uh, in starting in November that year in which very senior uh, jihadists were either freed or moved to other prisons. Uh, I've spoken to a number of people who were in, who were, who were civic right demonstrations in Aleppo University uh, in late 2011, early 2012. They were rounded up and they were taken to uh, uh, Mukhabarat Jawiya, Air Force Intelligence, or Aleppo Central Prison, and they found themselves being put together with radical Salafi jihadists. Now, there was no other reason for that other than to attempt to radicalize them. Now, the, the, I guess the narrative of, ISI, of uh, ISIS being aided and abetted by the Assad regime has been disputed. Let's look at the facts. Raqqa has been an ISIS stronghold since uh, probably about May 2013, maybe a little bit earlier, but around about that time. It wasn't attacked until June 2014 by the Syrian Air Force. Uh, early 2014, the, the opposition in the north of the country took on ISIS, uh, certainly around Idlib and Aleppo, in a six-week battle that cost them 1,500 lives, bare minimum. And at that same time, the Assad regime maneuvered around the eastern edge of Aleppo. It did not join the fray. It did not join them in, in a fight against a common enemy. It actually took on, it used that as an opportunity to try and close the, close the circle on, on Syria's biggest city. And to the strategic ends, uh, what were they aiming to achieve here? Look, the 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 power of the people, or the power of the street, exposing the fragility of authority, as happened in early 2011 during these massive demonstrations all around the country, that was something that a totalitarian state simply cannot tolerate. It exposes how weak, that they, are, how weak they are. It set about at that point to make it all about jihad, all about ter terrorism, because a popular uprising is something they couldn't counter. At the end of the day, when it did partly, not exclusively, certainly not, but partly become about a jihad, they were able to go to Europe and the West and say, look, we have a common enemy, help us fight them. And that's where we are right now. Now, thank you, Martin. So Hanan uh, Belchi is the representative of the Syrian National Coalition in, in, Norway. in Norway. You want to say a few words, please? Yeah. Are you going to speak in English or in yeah, Arabic? I, I can speak. Do you want to come up here? Here they are. Uh, thank yeah. you very much. Okay, I want to say
stand here. <coughs> um, good evening. Uh, uh, I didn't have any plan to speak here, but I, ha I, uh, I can uh, write from my paper. Uh, thank you for Frontline, uh, Frontline uh, uh, Club uh, for hosting, uh, for hosting uh, this ex exhibition. Um, I also thanks for uh, also for the panel, um, Mr. Uh, I'm Black and Moaz and uh, Christian and uh, Dr. Osama and uh, Martin. Martin, yeah. For me, it's very hard to uh, to look uh, at uh, photographs of this uh, torture, uh, but the pictures is uh, shows the reality in Syria. In addition, it shows the, the reason uh, why the Syrian people uh, uh, are going to Europe. Um, what, what would you do if you were uh, a Syrian family? Uh, the other reality in Syria, in, in Syria is uh, parallel uh, uh, bombs uh, by Assad by the Assad regime. Together with in torture, we can understand why, how the radicalization uh, in Syria becomes so uh, so much extreme. In the absence of international action, more than more and more Syrians are turning to. Uh, the extremists uh, for uh, protection. Sadly, Syrians, the Syrians, don't see other choices. Choices. Now, <coughs> the UK and the rest of Europe are consi consider considering uh, their next steps on Syria. Some are calling to work together with Assad uh, in, the, in, fi in the fight, in the fight uh, against ISIS. For me, to hear this makes me very ill. Very ill. Do they not know that because of this, this many Syrians see the lesser evil is ISIS? We need these pictures are the Assad regime. Why should anyone partner with, with this? I can't uh, run, run uh, uh, you, you that partner, partnering with this will open this, uh, 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 this uh, gates for hell. We need more vision and courage and valors. This is how we will find base and security for Europe and the Syrian people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so we now have, we have about 35 minutes uh, to talk about whatever we want to talk about. Please feel free to ask questions. Address your questions to an individual member of the panel, to the whole panel, whatever. But let's try and you know, let's try and get somewhere in this against this very grim backdrop. Who wants to go first? The gentleman here, please. Thank you. Good evening and thank you. Um, media focus tends to be around um, ISIS. Um, very little is said about Assad. And yet his regime have committed probably seven atrocities for every one that ISIL has done. Exactly. Why is it that we don't see enough in the public domain that may actually change the mindset of our politicians or other Western nations and get them to be a little bit better at responding to this? Um, I think uh, it's certainly an issue that um, 
my, my colleague Ian and myself have been reflecting on the, in the last few days. I mean, I've had, I've spent a lot of time inside of Syria uh, covering uh, the opposition side, mainly because I could never get a regime visa. Ian's had a bit more luck than me on that, but I could never do so. And, and we made a decision very early on that uh, we needed to stand on the side of the suffering. And we've done a lot of reporting from Homs, from Aleppo, from, from Idlib, from elsewhere in the country. And uh, as, as best we can, we've given a voice to those who have been exposed to, to terrible atrocities. Uh, we've allowed a, a simple human stories to speak to the broader narrative. And I guess as, a, as an organization, as a, as, a, as a global media brand, we certainly have put a lot of resources into that. And I think that um, I'm, I'm quite happy to defend our record on it. But I think collectively, you're right. I think that there is uh, a, a, a prevalence of coverage um, of, of ISIS, not without reason, because uh, what they have done, uh, certainly as an organization, as a, they're effectively a startup enterprise. I mean, they didn't really exist until uh, early 2013. And within a year, they changed the socio-religious character of the center of Arabia. Uh, at the moment, uh, the, the border between Iraq and Syria is, com is completely irrelevant. They control a swathe of land from the eastern edge of Aleppo all the way through to Mosul. This is very significant. But beyond that, it's seen as a key driver to homeland security interests in the UK and around Europe. So the vested interests uh, of, 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 of other countries are now piling in and saying, well, this, this is about us now. It's no longer about a, a squabble in a faraway land that's always uh, been troublesome anyway. But I, I do think, just bringing it back, there does need to be a, a, a renewed focus on why we are in this situation, the events that have led us to, to where we are, and, and how, at the end of the day, there, there needs to be a shift away from impunity and fear to accountability and actually justice. Because I do think the, there has been a, a profound moral failing when it comes to covering and understanding the events that have taken place in Syria. And um, you know, I, I, I don't want to speak ill of colleagues, but I, I think there are there are some that have have uh, conveniently looked look the other way and, and prosecuted a worldview that has nothing to do with an objective truth. From a Syrian point of view, well, I think in the beginning, what we saw is that the whole world was with the revolution. I mean, it's very easy for a Western citizen or for for a journalist of a reputable paper to to identify with the weak, with the yearning for freedom, and, and so forth. But if he doesn't achieve that and things get complicated, it does get boring after a while and very repetitive. And of course, you have, uh, what do you say, uh, uh, like a, a, a redacteur. He wants to sell editor. issues. An, an editor, thanks. Um, and then, of course, what, what you need, I mean, you know, Jews are news. Why, why, why not uh, the bearded ones, you know, and, and, and their atrocities? You can just hack into a very convenient civilizational divide, you know, and say, okay, this is... This is the ultimate stereotype, Islamic barbarism. It's not easy to, to find uh, good-looking heroes, you know. In, it's, ask me. I mean, I know a lot of Syrians that are, that, that are incredible, just in, incredible. Um, but uh, you, won't, you won't see them in the paper. Uh, and there's, sorry, and after a while, the, the final phase, and this is the one that, that, that we're in now, is that people are repulsed by the issue. I mean, look at these. These, these pictures, you, you won't find them anywhere. We had huge trouble bringing them into the European Parliament. Yeah. You know? it's just, they, they said, well, they're, they're offensive. Well, of course, that's the whole point <laughs> of showing them. But right? you were able to bring them in the end, I think. Well, we had to go through Martin Schulz, <laughs> and it worked. But the, yeah. the, the official committee in charge of designating out rooms said, no, no, I, I, no. none of that. So it's, it's not easy, you know. But isn't there a view in Syria? I mean, my, my experience of being in, in, in government-controlled areas, mostly, not completely, is that certainly in the last couple of years, you talk to Syrians about ISIS, Daesh, they think it's a, a Western obsession. They think it's, well, OK, they're very unpleasant people, and they do terrible <laughs> things. But there's a lot more to the story of Syria than that. Whereas in the West, I think I agree with the question. I think that. The focus is through a very narrow prism. When Daesh, when they, when they beheaded two American journalists, then the world sat up and paid attention yeah. to the horrors. But in Syria, it looks very different. Right? That's that's absolutely true. I mean, if you talk to Syrians, it's 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 you know for, for them, you know it's funny because he was mentioning you know he knows amazing people. There are so many 
ordinary people that have been put in these extraordinary positions that have done stuff that is just it's amazing they're amazing stories there should be a hollywood movie about each one of them it's it, it's really it's really incredible and, and very inspiring i think it's what drives a lot of people on the outside um like Osama and i and others to to do whatever we can to sort of advocate on their behalf you know even when we see that it's almost hopeless um you know i i, I mostly work in washington dc and in the white house has been sort of incredible in its in sort of avoiding of anything Syria related. Um, I, I think that Syrians are confused as to why ISIS demands and takes so much attention. And it is sort of a, a region that's usually rife with conspiracy theories, so those also come out and, 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 and so on. So for, for them, um, <coughs> it's they, they just don't know how, why that is. And I think because of that, then they, they sort of have to rationalize it for themselves one way or another. But I mean, my answer is that ISIS just must be much more sensational and, and funner to cover for the media. I mean, they're Christian. Good I think that's the key point, though, isn't it? That they tailor their atrocities to the media. That's sure. right. To the Western that's media. Their and, point. And, it, and, it's, and it's done in a way which is attractive to not just the Western media, but also a lot of social media activists. It's almost like when a new video is released on one of these servers, there's a race to find it and get it out there. And, 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 and that's part of the phenomenon that they will use <coughs> amplifiers, that's media right. amplifiers, social media amplifiers to get their, 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 their atrocities out there. Whereas the regime, you know, as we know, these reasons to smuggle out, you know, pre-uprising, yes, you know, torture wasn't always to kill, it was to extract information, but also to create fear and to go back to your communities, to your families and say, this is what happens if you, you know, um, have a salon discussing uh, revolution politics or, or, or whatever it might be organizing a petition about uh, you know uh, problematic irrigation or something whatever it might be and and the regime has been very very careful about closing down its atrocities so that you know so a very good example going back to the issue of uh, impunity and accountability there is a, uh, a UN mandated commission of inquiry the regime still blocks it still blocks uh, human rights organizations like ours access to the country. I mean, we get in we, we, when we have to. We have crisis researchers who can do that. Uh, and of course, it also <coughs> blocks uh, humanitarian agencies as well. And that's a, another area. I'm probably not going to have enough time to go into it, although it was interesting. It was my Guta and the siege there. That there, was, there is opportunities for people to be pushing the UN to, to break those sieges. They have a mandate to do that. They're just not acting on it. That's Situation, well, obviously. A, if I can answer, it's, it's, it, it's a huge problem. I mean, the international community is hiding behind in, international law. And, it, and, it, and, it, and, and the fish <laughs> stinks from the head, from the White House, I must say. It has declined and aggressively refused to exercise strategic leadership over the biggest humanitarian crisis since the Second World War. Syrians pose the largest single refugee population anywhere. We had 23 million when the issue began. We have now, I think, what is it, eight and a half now, dis displaced internally, four million registered <laughs> refugees outside. I, can, I don't know how it is here in England, but I run the office in Berlin. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Let's, uh, let's have another couple of questions. <coughs> Lots of people want to, gosh, uh, Forrest and Hans, the lady yeah. with the here, please, with the microphone, okay. Hello. Possession. Hi. Um, you touched on it just there, Osama. I work for a humanitarian organization, and we have amazing Syrian staff inside Syria who are running networks of schools and hospitals, but they can't prevent things like this happening. Um, and I think it feels like people feel almost at a bit of a loss now about what are the next steps to take, what can we do, and maybe it's an impossible question, but I wonder you know, your opinion on a panel of what should the international community be doing, whether that's pushing the UN to break sieges or whether that's an accountability me uh, mechanism or whether oh. it's military action, you know, what are the steps that they should be taking? Thanks. I have two more questions and we'll take them in bunches of three as there are so many. Lady here, please. Uh, my, my question is, um, uh, my, my question is twofold. Uh, it's one about how, the, how agencies can empower a, a voice for the Syrians inside because they are subject, there's a, the, it's sort of double jeopardy for, for Syrians because, I mean, as you say, Daesh, is, Daesh has its own uh, media channel and can communicate directly to the world, and it's very theatrical and a phenomenal sort of PR machine. Um, but 
it seems to me that the part of the problem with the recording, I mean, these are fantastic pictures, but this is old media. And we, you know, by showing images to people like us, you're, you're preaching to the choir, which is, um, but trying to create a, a more visible and uh, image of what's actually happening in, in Syria. And rather than just being victims, but actually being people, like you say, of power and of agency, I mean, how can that be facilitated? Because there does seem to be two wars going on, and one is that perhaps we can intervene in as either you know people like myself as you know in the media and my media colleagues and people in uh, different agencies is actually getting the message out and something that is sort of positive and rather than I don't mean that it's positive about the situation, but positive about the people Thanks. involved. Okay, so one more question now, please, the gentleman here. Uh, Thank you. It relates very closely to the, f the first question that Eddie asked, but it's about there was a lack of Western intervention was cited earlier on in the discussion. The most obvious point when that could have occurred recently was 18 months ago-ish when the House of Commons voted no. Yes. I'm curious to know, yes. was that right or wrong choice? Okay. And also a lot of the British public, they think we tried that in Libya, we tried it in Iraq. Let's, we don't want to get involved in pointless conflict anymore. So okay. I'm curious Thank to know you. if that was right or wrong. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so whoever, please pitch in. Let's try and answer all the well, questions. Let me say straight out, there was an opposition and there still is an opposition that the West recognized. You have the Syrian National Coalition, which is a mosaic of all the groups in the country. They're the only ones that reflect the entire mosaic of Syria. It was recognized as a slash the representative of the Syrian people by 114 states. But the type of support that they have received has been basically the way that you would build a bridge in Bolivia. Well, we'll send you some experts and we'll, we'll do something. The regime has hard support. It has a veto in the Security Council, and there were three exercised over Syria, three double vetoes, in including China. The whole history of the Cold War never witnessed that. And it has Iran, which was in there with militias. It uses a lot of its funds to get Shiite militiamen from Central Asia. I mean, we have people from, Af uh, from Afghan prisons uh, that are fighting in, in Dara on, on the border to Jordan. Very in in ineffective. But the regime has hard support. And we have a US president that, that, that does not believe in soft power, only when it addresses core issues or core interests of the United States. And Syria, according to him, does not belong to those core interests. Now, this has allowed for a power vacuum that has pushed in ISIS, the absolute insecurity will force the average Syria, Syrian to look for any group that will protect him and feed him. And Jabhat al-Nusra is a problem. They are homegrown Syrians, you know. Um, they say they are they are al-Qaeda, al but they have much more legitimacy than the West in parts of Idlib. I mean, I can speak to them on, on the phone, and I, you know, it's, it's, I'm incessant with it. Why do you call yourself al-Qaeda? You idiot. <laughs> and he says, well, look, this is between me and my creator. You know, I, I, I have to do you know, what I believe is right. I protect these people. Who are you to come and tell me of your values? You know? But the revolution and so forth is very hard. Right? But yes, I think it was a disaster. I think it'll be a blemish on labor for a long time to come that they basically stopped French fighters that were in the air to be joined by the English. And that basically made o o Obama uh, collapse on the issue of intervention. And these are the three basic steps where we see a huge push of jihadists into Syria. The first was chemical weapons and the step back from the red line, basically the red line deal. And the, the second was uh, the official intervention of Hezbollah, Shiite militias, coming to the Umayyad Mosque. I mean, imagine you had, you had a radical Protestant group take over the Vatican and do demonstrations and, you know. And the third was, of course, now, Russia going in there and bombing the rest of the civil society that is left. I mean, this is a disaster. Now, and I'd like to draw your attention to what the representative uh, from the, the coalition said. The lesser evil for you is the one without the beards. For Syrians, it will not be Assad. And I'm really afraid of this. I mean, we have a quarter of a million Syrians in Germany now. They storm my office. They want to storm the Russian embassy and, 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 and so forth. It's becoming very hard to deal with a political establishment in the West that has no vision and absolutely no values on, on Syria either. I mean, it's, it's not in dispute what, what, we're, what we're seeing here. This is going on now. 
We have a quarter of a million Syrians in jail. This is what they endure. Well, I don't know. It's hard to deal with. Uh, um, nobody wants to do it alone. Okay. Well, uh, if I may just say, I mean, uh, and, and alongside the Syrian National Coalition, you also have all the civilian councils that are in touch with the Syrian National Coalition uh, that are on the ground that are also deserving of support, that are completely ignored but have incredible credibility on the ground and do amazing work there. I want to mention, even when we do have Chapter 7 resolution signed on by the <laughs> Russians that went to, to call against the, the use of barrel bombs that, that have uh, that, that contain chlorine, and that was violated the day after, right after that was actually adopted in the UN by everybody, including the Russians. No one did anything. So, you know, we blame many times for all these different things, the lack of, you know, the Russian veto, and we can't go to the ICC. Because, but even when we did have that, it was documented. We brought a doctor from the ground, Dr. Tinari in Idlib, who treated this and put him in front of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He was there and he was talking about this along others. And, and it really is disgraceful uh, to, to see. I, I, I know Samantha Fowler well. We met with her many times. And, and I'm afraid she's become a case study of, of her book. Um, you know, you asked of, of what should happen and what could, could happen now. The very minimal that we can do, just the baseline, look at what is the number one driver of, of, of refugees um, and killer of Syrians. Those are these crude barrel bombs. If anyone's not familiar with what they are, essentially giant barrels filled with shrapnel and gasoline that are there. And I've seen, I've been in Syria, I've seen the, their, their direct aftermath and, and what happens. Absolutely zero military uh, uh, sort of strategy for them, other than they do kill a bunch of civilians and children, etc., and they displace populations. Um, the protection of civilians, the protection of civilians from aerial attacks, that should be, the, that, that should be what everyone is pushing for. Um, you know, I would say the Syrians really do feel alone, so <coughs> as much people that can talk about their plight, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sure, well, look, it's a no-fly zone. zone, and I'm not a military expert, and I can go, but, okay, no-fly zone, however that is seen as traditionally whatever, protected zone, safe zone, what have you. At the very minimum, these are, by the way, old Soviet helicopters that are flying low that go, and they, have you know, a guy with an iPad with Google Maps, and then they just push the thing out and, and kill a bunch of people. There are 17 military runways. Uh, that, that these uh, helicopters take off. That's 17 Tomahawk cruise missiles. No troops on the ground, no sorties flying in the air. You get rid of them and the rebels will be able to keep them from being rebuilt. That, at the very minimum, would save a ton of life. Not only that, it would actually, for the first time, show the world that, you know, if you go talk to Syrians on the ground, they think that uh, President Obama and the White House and the international community are on the side of Iran, Russia, even ISIS. I mean, th that really is what they believe, and I can't even explain otherwise to them. You know, I know that, the, the, and, and I'm sorry, one more thing you asked about, uh, sort of, the, you know, we see the, the media of, of, of ISIS and all this stuff. There are amazing independent media activists inside of Syria. One of them suggested something that's really powerful that can remind us, not just of this old evidence. Um, he said, you know, what if there was an app uh, that went off every time a barrel bomb fell. Yeah. Do you know how many times all your phones would have went off right now? A bunch of times, a barrel bomb falling in a place like, I don't know London very well, so I can't, I usually do like descriptions in DC, but you're talking about like, you know, a neighborhood just, you know, a few minutes away in a car where 10 barrel bombs are falling a day. Hasn't, if, the, um, hasn't the Russian intervention made a no-fly zone even more difficult? Yes, it did make routine? it more difficult in the sense that if, if you already have a reluctant um, international community to do something, if they're afraid of shooting down a Russian plane and starting World War Three, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that, that did make it more difficult, but that does not mean that we should give up on the number one ask, which is protect civilians from aerial attacks. That is what's killing so many people each single day. Mm -hmm. An application, for example, like that, which is, uh, I'm afraid I'm giving a suggestion to everybody. If anyone can make it, they should, because it would be incredibly valuable. But in Let's have some more questions now, please. Can I go just, just a little bit on course, that? Just a tiny bit on that, please. because there was a, um, you work with a hum humanitarian agency. There is humanitarian intervention happening with a UN mandate already under UN Resolution 2165 back in July, something the regime opposed, something Russia initially opposed, but came, came on board. And aid, aid is going into the country through a couple of crossing points in the north, Babel Haram, Babel Salam, and, and in the south. That's without the agreement of the without Syrian government, without crucially, the consent, right? That's this right. is the important thing, that without the consent of, of the regime. And that's something that actually could be built on, because as you touched on, Russia's intervention makes all these other 
ideas around buffer zones, air control zones, whatever you want to call them, much more difficult. Not impossible, it makes it more difficult. So what is there? Is there, a, without using a, a Blairite term, a third way, potentially through the UN and through the humanitarian <laughs> sector, which is already actually working. I think it's something like two and a half thousand trucks have gone in. Not one of them has been hit. Not one of them has been attacked. And what you're actually creating there are de facto humanitarian corridors when they're going in. What we would like to see is, is the UN taking a much more robust approach, using that mandate that it has, which is now 2165, 2191, to its logical conclusion and spending more time inside Syria and accessing more places, in particular some of the besieged areas. It's like Eastern Ghouta, like what, 12, 13 kilometers away from, from Damascus. Right. The UN can hear the bombs going off, yes. they can see them. And the same argument that we had and other humanitarians had in the build-up to July 2014 when that resolution passed was, look, you're, you're in Turkey. You can see the people. You can see the internally displaced people. You can see them being attacked, going. The, the regime has no sovereignty at these crossing points. It doesn't control the crossing points. So engage with the armed groups at those crossing points. Negotiate your access. Do your risk assessments. Get in. Start delivering your aid. They've been doing that, and they've been doing it quite successfully. Governments, particularly the UK, France, the US, and others, they need to be impressing upon the UN that they have the mandate to do that. If it means increased protection for the UN, that's what it means. But I think more imaginative ways are needed to immediately protect civilians because the no-fly zone discussion has been around since, what, August 2011. It's not happened yet. Okay, well, let's go harder. Okay, so three more questions, please. Uh, Ahlam here, please, at the front, and then we'll have a couple from over there. I know how difficult would it be to deal with Bashar al-Assad. Uh, uh, it's like uh, the rapist, uh, the raped woman marrying her rapist. It's it's ho it's horrible. But for a transitional period, do you think that there would be a consensus within the opposition to accept her for a transitional period? While because one of the things that is seen in the West and I can see it everywhere is the, the fractionization of the opposition. I mean, you, <coughs> you don't seem to be speaking in one voice. You don't have a coherent uh, proposal for international community or something. So would you, would you accept a, a, a during, I mean, dealing with Bashar for a transitional period of, let's say, six months, uh, as well as putting your vision during this six months as how to you are gonna run the country uh, on the economical level as well as uh, okay. policy, political. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have this lady here who's been asking for a long time. Uh, I have a question that actually goes along with this transitional period. What mechanism of transitional justice do you want to see happen in Syria? What do you find would best suit the Syrian people? We see the, the, uh, the different war crime tribunals or the truth commissions that were in South Africa. What do you think best suits the Syrian people? And if there is a, a trial, if that's the mechanism that you want to see, how soon should that happen? Because we know after conflict, collective and individual memory naturally is forgotten over time. So in order to maintain those narratives and make sure that those people are heard, how soon do you see that happening? Somebody over here, lady at the end there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for the panel, which was really interesting. Uh, my question is, don't you think the media somehow have a responsibility in, we were saying before, the media are not showing atrocity committed by the Assad regime, they are showing just atrocity committed by ISIS. The media are not showing at all the, the opposition, the National Syrian Coalition. I read the news every day on Syria. I studied Middle Eastern politics, and I have no clue where the Syrian opposition, the Syrian people are, as you were saying before. And for what I can see, um, as the representative from the Syrian Coalition said, um, I understand for Syrians seeing more of a threat, ISIS, than uh, the Assad regime. But for a Western perception, the only two things that we see are either Assad or ISIS. And we see as uh, 
less evil uh, part of the conflict. As that, we don't see the good part of the conflict. There is no way. So I guess, like, and I don't even think governments have the chance to see that that much. Maybe uh, military intelligence or things like that, but not even the government knows of the existence of, of a credible existence. Okay. Thank the you. Field. Thank you for that. So we have some questions about the important questions about the attitude of the Syrian opposition to transition Assad, justice, and then the media again. Please. Sure. Should I start? Go ahead. Um, the opposition, where are they and why are they so fractionalized? It's very difficult because they have to set up a type of balance system between all the groups there. The Christians, the Druze, the Alawi, the Ismaili, the Turkman, the Cherkasi, the Dagestani, and all these different groups. Um, have to have a bearing. This leads to a very fragile system in itself. Uh, they were voted in by the local councils all over Syria. It's actually the only opposition in the Arab world that, that has achieved that. Um, and in addition, the situation has been so horrendous that they've only been able to react. It basically put out a statement, uh, send somebody there, talk to them and not to really plan proactively. Now, of course, there's the opposition called the National Coalition, and then there's the interim government. The central political mechanism was that there will be a transitional body, a government, with full executive powers. <clears throat> this was the basis for the Geneva discussions. Um, and of course, yes, the government um, in, is there in Damascus. It holds the power over the state. It hides behind its sovereignty, and the opposition challenges this. This They have gone to Geneva twice to discuss with Assad this transitional period, and I was there, you know? I mean, you basically have them making proposals. Okay, we could have a government with the following people. These are our, our lists, moderate people that you can accept, or technocrats and so forth, and the regime, under foul language, will just swear at them the whole time. And Lahdar al-Ibrahimi, the UN uh, special envoy, told me this personally. He said, it's a, it's a shame. And he apologized in, on, on Al Jazeera television to the Syrian people. There was nothing that I could do. The regime is intransigent. There's nothing that, makes, that gives any type of hope that this will be different in the future. Because a transitional period for Assad will become a permanent presence for Assad under Russian protection. Russia is not there to fight ISIS. They are there to keep something called Syria in some part of Syria under its control and to have a main say over who will be in charge. Um, in terms of the opposition, they have gotten support by Qatar. Now the, the Gulf countries have helped quite a bit, um, but it's been cash on and off, the tap on and off. That's very difficult to deal with when the opposition leaders and their families, I mean, I know, for example, Faiz Sara, one of the political committee, they called him on the phone, tortured his son to death. Now, this is very, like, a scenario like that to be a political leader and to have vision is very difficult um, when you have no structures. You have to have a regular flow of money. You have to have the ability to, to, to build up services. And again, in Syria, whoever feeds you can uh, you know they'll 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 believe in you and they and they will follow you. Um, so there's been there's there's been no will from the Western states to really provide the type of support that is needed by the opposition and that is not a legal expert to come with a with a legal expert Western salary and to stay there for for three days and to advise. They need somebody there. They need safe routes within the country and they've built up immense things. I mean the local councils are all over the country. As soon as they build them up, they've been bombed. I mean, our civil society groups now, we have, we have uh, work in all parts of the country, even under ISIS. They are bombed as soon as they stand. I mean, the children's hospitals in, in Dara. I can show you the maps. Uh, um, so in terms of what, what can be done, and I think this is the key question, um, we've seen how thin the, layer, the civilizational layer is and how, how it can dissipate. I don't want this to be reproduced here for you to go home and say, well, this is a really tough issue. I don't know what I can do. There is something that we can do, and this is what Western democracy provides for us. You can participate in the debate in the media. It will not change by complaining. We can focus on the good part. I, I, I urge you to do this and to participate in the commentary section of, I don't know, the Independent and whatever newspapers are putting out the idea of speaking to Assad. 
and support a no-fly zone because in, in the end these are the values for which we stand. But let's hear from Waz about the transitional justice question I think that this sure. lady was asking. Well, you know, it, we actually, we, we do some work um, in partnership with, with an institution in, in Washington called Public International Law and Policy Group um, on, on work on the ground in terms of reconciliation, transitional justice, sort of. I, I can tell you that the, the Caesar team, when you ask them uh, about the file, one of the things they say, well, we don't want this to be a hindrance for a political solution. We don't. We want this to be a key part of, of transitional justice, reconciliation, and moving forward. Um, there's a movement um, even within sort of within the Alawite community in, in areas where there is no bombing and, and, and there is no, no war but but the Alawites are poor they were never taken care of uh, by Bashar many of their children have died uh, fighting for him a and you know what's interesting is, is in this sort of movement which is a lot of it's sort of on social media and stuff we've seen other parts of the country where if, either it's an FSA soldier or somebody from a council sort of uh, you know, recording their own video and replying back, and that's beautiful to see that, you know, Syrians talking to Syrians is important. The negotiations right now, if we speak about who negotiates even when it comes to oil ceasefires, the Iranians have a negotiating team in Turkey that negotiates directly with the armed opposition in Zabadani to do what? The six months uh, ceasefire that was agreed to and was breached by Assad himself by bombing the next day was to displace Sunni populations from Zabadani, uh, which is just the population of the, of the city, and the fighters, and send them up to Idlib where they're going to be barrel bombed. By the way, these guys are happy to stay in their home and fight for it, um, but if you're sending them off somewhere else and forcing them out there, they're, they're coming here. <laughs> you know, They're not going to be just sitting under barrel bombs in a place where they don't even know where they are. And the Syrian leaders are not just the National Coalition and the civilian councils, but also other heroes that are really there and are incredible. I don't know why people don't know about them, because they're willing to travel, they're willing to risk their lives to get out and talk and come back in. I, I mean, Dr. Tenari came to the United States, he treats people uh, on, you know, after the barrel bombs, and could have stayed and asked for asylum, but he went back to Idlib, where he's bombed regularly. There's a town, small village in Idlib called Kaframbul, a very beautiful, they, they do these amazing paintings. The woman that you see there, uh, we identified, by the way, she's, she's a pharmacy student from Deir Zor, who was in Damascus. In Damascus, you have a bunch of internally displaced uh, refugees living in parks, essentially. She was providing them medicine uh, and, uh, and food and so on. That was her crime. That's why she was tortured to death. And they drew a picture of her in the same way, but sort of with flowers and, and things. <coughs> it, it's beautiful what they do. And, and so their stuff is out there, but the media is not interested in covering that. They'd much rather talk about Baghdadi. Um, and, and finally, you know, to your question, Assad has come out recently, I, I read it, and, and said that he doesn't want to negotiate for now. And Assad in Geneva, I'm not part of the Syrian opposition coalition, but they did a magnificent job in Geneva. And, and Brahimi himself came out and said, I mean, this guy wasn't interested. The fact is that Assad was counting on a military victory. And so he wasn't willing to negotiate. And when he's weak, he doesn't want to negotiate because he believes that he's in a weaker position, so he'd rather not. And, and so we're stuck with a regime that's just hopeless and now with the Russians in he's back at the military victory thing so that's not even an option to even discuss in the first place whether he should be part of you know and as you said it is the rapist speaking to the woman that, that he raped so it should be Syrian to Syrian dialogue between uh, leadership within the Alawite community within other communities in Syria uh, to Syrians that we see it starting up at the grassroots level but it needs to be moved over to sort of an Oslo on Syria that takes away the Iranian negotiators and the Russians out and let Syrians talk to Syrians. So we're really out of time, and I'm sorry because it's been a very vibrant and interesting exchange. I think I'd like to ask everybody on the platform just to say a few final words, perhaps with a message, gloomy, pessimistic, optimistic, or whatever, and of course we can all meet and have a drink in the bar afterwards and carry on discussing things. Martin, do you want to? I just want to address in general terms uh, what the gentleman was asking before about what we should, what we may have done in 2013. I do think one of the fundamental dynamics, dynamics in terms of the the uh, international diplomacy in in this whole conflict has been the way, the different way that Obama has projected his administration. Um, he he has he's, he's he hasn't wanted to lead on this. There hasn't been any attempt to strategically lead. He has wanted to partner up, sit in the background, and push along gently. That hasn't worked. That was being perceived as weakness by every single stakeholder in the region. Uh, it was never going to do anything other than add a very 
potent variable at the most vol volatile time in the Middle East for the last 70 years, in which, rightly or wrongly, the US had underwritten the regional security order. It hasn't done that anymore. It's not doing that now. And we talk about vacuums. ISIS has filled one part of it. The, uh, you know, the Russians are in there behaving with impunity. Iran is, 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 is doing it likely. The, the Saudis are flapping about it and saying, well, what do we do next? I cannot see a way that this is all going to be brought to any sort of a resolution at any point soon, soon unless there is you know, a collective realization that uh, individual interests have to combine because if, the, if they don't, if they don't, uh, if, if they don't actually form some kind of a way forward, then the only option is mutually assured destruction. So I think we're a long way away from any solution, unfortunately, and I think the events of the last couple of weeks have, uh, have, have made that even further away. Christian, any, any um, cheery final thoughts? I mean, I can say some cheery things, but I'll just going back to that Assad point very, very briefly, Outside of the ethical and legal arguments, which is where someone from Amnesty would probably be talking from, just from a logical perspective, Assad's a warlord amongst other warlords now. There is not a, just think logically, there's not a chance in hell he can run that country as a president of the whole country anymore. And that's been the case since uh, late 2012. For a very, very long Absolutely. time. He can't go on some sort of charitable tour like he used to in the old days up to Idlib or down in, in Dada or, or whatever. That's not going to happen. So he's a warlord in, and it's possible that what the Russians are doing, if you look at where their strikes are, is possibly carving out uh, a future mini state uh, for Assad, possibly. That's speculation. Don't want to go into it. In terms of sort of the sort of signs of hope, it's difficult now with what with what Russian Russian uh, intervention has done. That's kind of changed the dynamic and may well have killed off the Geneva process, quite possibly. Even the Syrian coalition, which are the most moderate of moderates, to use that term, are promising harsh, brutal measures against the Russians. You know, and you're seeing a coalescence of groups that were it was very difficult for them to work together in the past without going into all the names of the groups. You know, and that actually plays into the narrative of Russia. And, and Assad, so there's a bit of a trap there. But where has there been international agreement? Let's look, go back to those Security Council uh, resolutions where there has been agreement and to look at uh, where some element of hope is, where you can build on those. And the one I mentioned there is because someone from the humanitarian sector mentioned it, is one of those. You know, we can talk about transition, justice, civil society, justice mechanisms, all we want. If there's no security on the ground, None of it matters. So there needs to be security <coughs> on the ground with the primary focus of civilian protection. And I do think it needs an impartial third party on the ground doing that with a very, very robust mandate. And you know, the UN have been quite reluctant to go down that. They don't want to shoot their way in, obviously. But standing back from Syria and looking at other conflict situations like maybe Central African Republic or the DRC, we, we can see that the UN, when it wants to be robust, it can go in with force uh, to protect civilians. Uh, it's not ideal, it's not well resourced, but th there's something there because as, as Martin was saying, this isn't gonna end anytime soon. This is a, a very long conflict and, and civilian protection needs to be the priority. And some civilian protection measures which are advocated may well make the situation uh, far, far worse actually. Sorry, last word. Um, well, uh, <laughs> hope is not a strategy in itself, um, so, we need a no-fly zone, and I would ask you to support it. What? We need a no-fly zone. you got to stop at least the aerial bombardment of civilians. You call it whatever you want, protected, whatever makes you feel better about the term, but that's what's needed. And, and I can tell you, you know, one danger that, that we haven't reached, but, but that's big, and I wanted to mention it before, is that, you know, the majority of the Syrian people, and I abhor talking in sectarian terms, majority of the Syrian people are, are Sunnis, and if, if, if these Sunnis start looking at each other as an ethnic group rather than a religious group, then we're looking at, at a real danger, and then and, I, mean, I can go into details, but I'll, I'll stop there, because I, I, I want to say that that's too grim. I want to say that when you go to Syria, when you cross the border and you meet these kids and these people there on the ground, or the ones that are doing urban farming, or the ones that can only sneak in eggs but no chickens, so they figure out how to incubate the eggs to keep them going, these people are hopeful and these people believe that even if the world has deserted them um, that, that they will be victorious with the same core values that they had at the beginning of that revolution. And I can tell you for the United States, for the United Kingdom, for Europe, 
the na our national values in these countries, uh, our national interests and our values are actually aligned. I, it's, it's hard to me to understand why we're not acting to protect civilians and, and the no-fly zone is, is definitely a, a, a great start. Thank you all. Thank you to the panel. Thank you. Thanks.